Hey, good morning. Thank you for joining us for a recent sermon from Harvest Baptist Church. I'm Mark Likens. I'm the lead pastor here at Harvest. We're a Bible-believing, gospel-centered, grace-driven church family right here in Natrona Heights, Pennsylvania. And if you'd like to learn more about our ministry, you can visit us on Facebook or at harvestbaptist.info. Now, I hope you enjoyed today's sermon. It's my prayer that this will encourage and equip you in your relationship with God. Well, 1 John chapter number 5, we're continuing our study through this book of the Bible. We're approaching the end. If you remember, uh, we covered the back half of chapter number 5 in our first sermon in this book. So really, we only have 12 or 13 verses to cover. I will cover 5 this morning. I wanted to cover 12 uh, but really, verses 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 are some of the most complicated in all of the book, probably the most complicated, and I thought it, it better to put them off in its own separate sermon. So we'll cover this this morning. Uh, next week, we'll cover uh, 10, 11, 12, and 13, because that passage in particular is very gospel-centered. It's not theologically complex, really. It's just it's a fastball down the middle, and I, I'd love to spend next week with Friend Day and, and uh, more people uh, being here and, and potentially even some friends that you have that are maybe far from God or don't know the Lord uh, to say, hey, look at this passage of Scripture that talks about a no-so salvation and how Jesus offers eternal life. And then we'll circle back around uh, to the, the passage that we've kind of uh, skipped over. So in case you're wondering over the next two weeks, you skip that portion. I, I know, I know. We'll get back to it. So today is chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Let's read these verses together, and then we'll try our best to understand them. It says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commands are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This morning I want to give you four principles for Christian living, all right here from this text. The first of which is that good dads want their children to get along. Now we've hit this throughout the course of John, so I will not belabor this, but he mentions yet again the idea of Christians loving other Christians. That if you love God and they love God, then you will demonstrate that love of God by loving each other. Hey, I'm born of God. Hey, me too. That means we share the same father, so we're going to get along and we're going to love each other. And a heavenly father, a good heavenly father does this. He says, I want my children who are in the family to get along and to be a family. And a good earthly father will do the same. Or mother will want their children <clears throat> to get along. A good dad will not pit his children against each other. A good dad will not pit his children against his spouse. A good mother will not pit the children against the husband. And that happens all the time in marriages where you start to divide up or choose teams or start to rally the forces behind you so that your argument can be more forceful with your spouse. No, 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 no. You want unity. You want love. You don't want to divide the family. And God says, if you love me, then you will love each other. If you love the one that begat, you love the one that's giving birth, you are born of God, then you will love the ones that are also begotten of him. That's what he's saying. This is part of the travesty of Jacob's life in the book of Genesis. That Jacob has a lot of lows and a lot of highs, but one of his lows is that he has 12 sons. The eldest 10 do not like the 11th son, Joseph. And Jacob probably didn't do a lot of favors to his children there with how he played favoritism to Joseph and all those sorts of things. But eventually the 10, uh, the ten brothers begin to plot the murder of the younger brother, Joseph. Now that's a bad day. When a group of your children are plotting the murder of another one of your children, your home is dysfunctional, okay? That's not good. But it happens, and they don't love each other. But that's not God's plan for you and your family. That is not God's plan for his family. His plan is that we would love each other. And a good parent understands that I'm going to do my best to encourage my children that love me to take their love and to push that love out to the other children in the family, right? Right? 
I do not want, I have three boys and a girl. I don't want my boys to pick on, on Willow, the girl. And sometimes she picks on them. It could be both ways. But if one of the boys was picking on Willow, it would be fair and fitting for me as their dad to say, Hey, son, do you love me? Yes. Well, if you love me, you wouldn't treat Willow that way if you knew how I felt about Willow. And if you love God, you would not treat his children that way if you knew how he felt about them. And he says, I want you to feel the same way I feel about them. I want you to love them. Then it's interesting in verse number 2, he says this. He says, by this we know that we love the children of God. So verse 1, if I love the one that begets, then I love the begotten. If I love dad, then I love the children. Verse 2, how do I know that I love the children when we love God? What what is he saying? It's a two-way street. If you love me, you love them. If you love them, you love me. Love each other. That's what he's saying. It's very simple. He's attacking it from both angles, but he's telling you the same point. Love each other. Principle number two. The shortest distance between you and the best life is obedience. He starts to get into this at the end of verse number two. He says, you love each other. You love God, yes, but then you what? You keep his commandments. Verse number three. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous this is exactly what jesus taught if you love me keep my commandments and i am so i am so glad that he put the ending to verse number three that god in his wisdom said you're going to need to know this i just want to remind you keep my commands but my commands are not grievous they are not burdensome they are not heavy they are not weighty so what do i do with these commands Keep them. That word keep means to guard like it's a treasure. That we look at them intently and we attend to them carefully and we keep a careful eye on them. So what is he saying? He's saying be a commandment keeper. Why? Well, because you love God and he wants you to. Why else? Well, because you love your brethren and that's a command. Well, why else? Well, because it's easiest. They're not heavy and burdensome. It's best for you. His commands will lead to life. His commands will lead to joy. Meaning, every time God says, thou shalt not, he's saying, don't hurt yourself. And every time he says, thou shalt, he's saying, help yourself to some happiness. Those are the commands of God. And parents, you know this when you're trying to tell your your child, hey, don't touch the stove because it's hot. Oh, but I really want to. You're being mean to me. No, you're trying to keep them from danger. Don't play in the street. They don't get it, but you get it, right? You're trying to lead them into life and into joy. And in the same way, when God gives us commands that are there, shouts and shout not, he's trying to lead us away from danger and to happiness. Now, the question is, do you believe that? Because if you have that belief, it will lead to a behavior. And you will begin to keep his commandments. But you have to, you have to start to compute that. And this is very simple, yet it's so profound. On one level, it's simply saying there are commands, meaning there is a commander who gives commands. Now, there's, there's different roles if you have commander and those that are to obey the commands. Those are very different roles. And you can't invert those. You can't act like the commander doesn't exist. The one who says unequivocally, here is the command, you must obey. This is for your life. This is for your help. That person is the commander. Now, this is a problem for us, number one, because we have a sin nature and we're selfish and we don't like to be told what to do. Number two, because most of us in the room are American citizens. Most of us grew up here. And if, if you assimilated into the country, welcome, and you may have already picked up on this, but those of us that grew up on, in, in America, we get this. We are the country, and we're proud of it, that we rejected sovereignty, although we still have this weird aversion to it, and we, we are fondly you know, enamored with what happens with the queen. Obviously, she passed this week, and there's been a, a lot of press on what's happened in England, and every Easter, people want to know what they wore. We want to watch the royal weddings. We're weirdly enamored by it, but at the same time, fundamentally, we are the people that said, uh, we have no sovereign. No taxation without representation. Don't be putting a law on me without someone representing me and saying, you know, they're advocating for it. They're saying this is good. Don't you dare make a unilateral command or decree and just force it upon me. Don't tread on me. We are the people that threw that off 
and adopted what we, most of us, believe to be a better system, a republic that has representation, that people are elected officials, not just born into it, not just some pedigree, and we put them forth. And if you don't do what I say or what I think you should do, then I will email you and I will call your staffer or I will not vote for you. That I have a say and I have power in this, this idea of a monarchy or a sovereign. Even if I call that guy or gal commander-in-chief, uh, no, not really. If you don't, if you do something I don't like, then I will take the Facebook. I will let the world know. This is the society that we live in, right? And with this, we have a statue of liberty, not a statue of sovereignty. Uncle Sam shakes his fist at the monarchy. You know, this is who we are. Like, with this, I have rights. Have you read the Constitution? Can become this groundswell of Nobody tells me what to do. And that's not to mention the individualism of our society that is, that is very far from uh, honoring family and different honor cultures or shame cultures that we do not exist in. And there can be all these factors at play in our lives that can lead us to reject the idea of a commander, of a lord, of a sovereign, of a king who says, here are the laws. Here are the commands. Don't do the end. And we don't like that. There's something in us that bristles at that. It goes against our grain many times. But fundamentally, a Christian has to accept the lordship of the Lord Jesus. That's why there's Lord there, right? That you are in control. There is this creator, creation, shepherd, sheep, Lord, servant, relationship that I have entered into. And that means fundamentally that he gets to give commands, that he gets to tell us what to do. And it is our job to willingly and gladly submit and obey those as countercultural as it may be. But what he says here is not just, and I love it, it's not just that there is a commander and there are commands and you better keep them. He says the reason you should keep them, there's a lot of reasons, but one of them is the commands are grievous. They're not heavy. They're not burdensome. They're not meant to be a problem. You say, Pastor, hold a time out. How does that work? Because there have been some commands that like felt heavy. Anyone ever been there where it's like, I don't want to obey that. I would much rather do it my way. That is, that is against my grain. Uh, that seems culturally regressive. That I don't like. That Ever been there? It's part of the reason I know that this book came from, from God and not me because there's a lot of stuff that steps on my toes. That's a good sign that it's not just an inventing of my imagination because I wouldn't write it that way. But what do you do? Uh, but hold on, they're not grievous, but they feel grievous. I think maybe a window into this comes from Sarah Jewett's book. She was an early American author in the, in the mid-1800s, and she, in her book, The Country of the Pointed Furs, talks about life in Maine. And she uses, as the centerpiece of her story, this retired sea captain named Elijah Tilly. And Tilly had this beautiful house, and he had this plot of land that he used to farm. But in Tilly's land were these stakes that he had driven into the ground that were relatively pronounced. And he painted them the same color as his house. And people would walk by and be like, what's up with the stakes? You know, like, what is, is that like lawn decor? What are you doing here? I don't really see a, a pattern or a rhyme or reason. They couldn't make sense of it. And Tilly had plowed the ground. And on his first plowing, every time he hit a large rock that was slightly below the surface with his plow, he put a stake right next to the rock. So that when he plowed, or when his boy grew up, and now he was teaching his boy to plow, that he would say, hey son, here's the plow, here's how it works. Go in a straight line, it's a lot easier, but when you get to the stake, I want you to jog, and I want you to zig, and I want you to go around the stakes. And the young boy would say, Dad, like a straight line is way easier. Why, why are you putting all this extra work on me for me to zig and for me to zag and for me to go that? It's just easier to go in a straight line, you know, and would, would argue with them some until Tilly explained, Son, I know where the rocks are. They're right there. And if you hit that, your life will be more difficult. I know it is more difficult to zig than to go in a straight line, but I'm telling you, you zig there or your life will become exceedingly difficult. And in the same way, when you get the commands of God, it is God saying, I'm driving a stake in the ground 
There is an impediment here. There is a rock here. There is trouble for you here. I know it feels like you have to zig and you have to jog and it's extra work and it's not, it's not the easiest in the world. But I'm telling you, this is the easiest way. This is the most profitable way. This is the way that will lead to life. I'm trying to keep you out of trouble. Trust my stakes. And as humans, we have to step back and say, okay, I'm not immortal. I'm not all-knowing. I trust in a God who knows more than me. And if he says do or he says don't, that's not grievous. He's trying to help me. And the opposite of that is true. That the way of the transgressor is hard. Keeping God's commands is the best. It is the, it is the, the most straightforward path between you and the best life. is a life of obedience. But if you disobey and if you sin, the Bible is abundantly clear. You'll hit the rock and your plow won't like it. You'll damage yourself. You'll damage other people. Sometimes we, we mistake ourselves and we, we either say, A, I can handle this sin, or B, if I can't handle the sin, it'll only affect me and I'm prepared to bear the consequences. Wrong. Wrong. The consequences will not come to just you many times. You have no guarantee that your disobedience and your sin will only affect you as if you sinned in a vacuum. Ask the sailors on Jonah's boat. They're in the middle of the storm about to die, and it wasn't because they did something wrong. It's because Jonah did something wrong. And you fail to recognize that one day you're going to step on a boat and there's going to be other sailors there, and you're going to affect them and you're going to hurt them or you're going to damage them or endanger them because of your sin. His commandments, not grievous. The way of the transgressor, hard. So what do you do? You keep his commands, and part of the reason you keep his commands is out of an appreciation for them. Not just because he said, and that's reason enough, but God gives us more reasons than that. He says, look, trust me. If you want to choose transgression, man, it's a boomerang. You'll throw it out, and you'll be fine for a little bit, but it's going to come back, and it's going to come back with force. And you will not like the, the whirlwind that it creates in your life. So keep my commandments. So here we are. We're Christians who love each other. We love the brethren. We are Christians who understand that obedience is the, is the most straightforward path <clears throat> to the best life. But thirdly, and I think this is worth inserting into here, God's laws are for everyone, and your rules are for you. So there's several places in the Bible where this is said overtly. It's intimated here, and I think it's worth pointing out. Because I've been around church long enough to know how this goes. Pastor, all right, I compute everything you just said. But man, I feel like there's been some times where the commands were grievous and I was doing my best to obey and it felt heavy and it felt weighty and the joy was sucked out of me. What in the world happened? Not all the time, but many times it's because someone, a parent or a pastor or some sort of leader, failed to delineate between God's commands and the house rules. Both are necessary and needful, but there is a difference, and you must be sure to separate them. Because if you have God's commands that you say, thou shalt, and if you don't, it's a sin, and you better confess, that's wrong. And then you add the house rules on top as though they are commands and as though those are from the law of God. And now you have to keep all of that as well. That becomes very heavy and very grievous. So, for example, there are commands that you are to obey. Then you can, at your own discretion, and just employ wisdom. You can invent your own rules for you. You can invent your own rules for your marriage. You can invent your own rules for your family. You can even invent your own rules for the church. So, for example, there are many things we do here that are commands. Baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Got it. There are some things we do here as a church that are house rules. If you want to serve in our nursery, you have to be background checked. We feel that that is wise and prudent. But God never said that. And it would be a problem if we started to act like God said that, right? 
God never said, thou shalt have a nursery. God never said, you better get everyone background check. That's not there. It is just a house rule of prudence. But we do not mistake a command of God for a house rule, right? Parents, you are told, if you're a Christian parent, to raise your children in the nurture and in the admonition of the Lord. And whether you realize it or not, you have a lot of house rules that you have constructed to try to help you do that. At least I hope you're trying to aim that in that direction. And it's funny. Different families will different ha- have different house rules. One family will say, I should raise my children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You know what? That means that when they go to school, I want them to go to a Christian school where they will learn a Christian worldview. I do not want my children to sit in the seat of the scornful, so I'm going to send my kids to a Christian school. The end. Another family will say, God told me to raise my children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He didn't tell you to raise my children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So it's my job. They're going to stay with me. They're going to be at home. And I'm going to homeschool them because it's my job to make sure that gets done. Another family will say, I'm supposed to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. This means that they're going to have to stand against the world. They're going to have to stand on their own two feet. I don't want to keep them in a bubble and then send them off the pit and then then be blindsided. I think that they should be in public school. I know that they're going to face some temptations they wouldn't otherwise have. I know they're going to get some teaching they wouldn't otherwise have, but we're going to talk through it, and I would rather guide and shape and help direct them while they're under my care than than be out of my care and, and never have, you know, gone down that path at all. Now, three families all saying, God, I love you. I want to raise my children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Great. It's a command. Do it. But all three families have constructed different house rules to help them keep that command. And can you see where the problem may lie? When one family says, well, if you love God, then you would homeschool like we do. And they say, well, if you really love Jesus, you wouldn't put your, your children around those heathen in the public school. And they say, well, your kids should grow up sometime and they, they can witness and be a light. What, you want them to be hit under a bushel all day? And all of a sudden you're fighting because you make your house rules commands of God. Now, I have a preference. In our family, we have something that we do. Even here as a church, we have a private academy. So it may show you where I personally would tilt. But those are my rules. They're not your rules. You have to use wisdom and prudence to figure out what is best for you and your family. Get it? But you don't mix those two. Parents, grandparents, be very careful when you're teaching your children. Here is what God says. Here's what we're going to do. And let's separate. These are the house rules. Have house rules. You need them. Make your children obey them. It's good for them. But they may choose to do something different when they get out of the house. That's not a clear command, right? The same thing happens from church to church. It's my job as a pastor to try to do my best to separate those things and to say, look, here's what God says, and here's something that may just be wise and you can choose for yourself. There's a difference. I thought I would give you a few of the house rules that over my life were preached to me as though they were God's laws. Maybe these ring a bell for some of you. Maybe they don't ring a bell for some of you. But uh, I took five minutes and I just jotted a few down and uh, it put a scowl and a smile on my face all at the same time. So here is the, uh, the book of first and second opinions that I got preached to me occasionally. So I just wrote a few down. Uh, and these are not like conversations with people. These are things I've heard preached from a pulpit, um, which I would disagree with preaching them as God's command. So it's a sin not to wear a tie to church, right? Because after all, God deserves your best, and, and your best is probably a tie. That looks the best. That looks the sharpest. You better wear a tie. No one ever talks about tuxedos and cummerbunds and how that would be even elevated, but whatever, uh, tie. It's a sin for women to wear pants, right? Uh, look at the bathroom sign. Men, pants. Women, dress. It's obvious. You know, you, sh- you, should, you should not wear pants, women. Uh, it's a sin to ride in a, in a car alone with your girlfriend. God says don't, don't be sexually active before you're married. You're going to be tempted. You have emotions. You have hormones. You have all these desires, all these sorts of things. Take yourself out of the way of temptation. Never be alone with them, period. Never be alone in the car, and then you'll, you know, everything will be honky-dory, and you'll never sin, um, which doesn't obviously work all the time. Uh, it's a sin to go to a movie theater. Because Hollywood, do we endorse what Hollywood does? A lot of it's evil, a lot of it's vile, a lot of the messaging is terrible and and wicked and despicable. So why would you endorse Hollywood? Why would you go to a movie theater? It's a sin to eat at a restaurant that serves alcohol. 
God says don't be drunk. If you're going somewhere that serves alcohol, they could think that you're being drunk. Abstain from all appearance of evil, right? That's what the Bible says. So it appears that you could be doing evil if you go in there. And so abstain from appearance of evil. Don't eat anywhere but Cracker Barrel, but fiddlesticks. Cracker Barrel started serving alcohol too, and now that one's off the table. We got Taco Bell. That's all we have left. You can't get a tattoo. It's a sin if you feel depressed. Uh, it's a sin if you wear Nike. Anyone ever get the Nike sermon? Am I the only one? Ni I don't know if you knew this. Nike is the name of a Greek goddess, the goddess of victory. That's, that's why they, they chose the name Nike. So anytime you buy Nike, you are obviously endorsing Greek mythology and the pantheon of Greek gods. You may as well, well buy a shirt that says Allah or Buddha when you wear a shirt that says Nike. It's the same thing. It's a sin to have drums in church. It's a sin to do any work on Sunday. It's a sin to do an Easter egg hunt. I could go on and on. Things. Now, I'm not saying all those are trash. Not, not at all. It may be really wise for someone to not ride in alone with, in a car with the opposite sex. And that rule may really help them live for Jesus and live a holy life. I'm not saying those are, those are bad in and of themselves. Well, that someone should, you know, if, if, if uh, hey, I only want to wear a skirt, that shame on you. That, that's silly. I'm not saying that. What I am saying, though, is that you have to separate between God's clear commands of what he said do and don't and the rules that you use or the standards you use to support those commands. There's a difference. And his laws are for everyone. But his rules, or your rules, are for you. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying, especially if you're anywhere between the age of 10 and 20. Okay? Parents, I'm going to do you a favor. If you're 16, do not go home and say, Mom, you hear what Pastor Mark said? He said that if you can't show me where it says it's a sin, then I don't have to do it, and it doesn't matter. I'm not saying that, okay? Show me where it says it's a sin to eat poison ivy. It doesn't, but it's dumb, okay? <laughs> there are certain things that there's wisdom, there's common sense, there's prudence. So young people, don't, don't misconstrue what I'm saying, and you go bristle or you go fight your parents against their house rules. God never said when a kid could get a cell phone or if they should have a cell phone. He never said it. But every family gets to decide. So if you're 14 in the room and your parents say no cell phone and the other kid that's in your class has a cell phone, respect and honor your parents because the command is to honor your parents. Okay? Can I be clear on that? The point that I'm trying to make is that you don't take your rules and start to beat people over them and make the law of God grievous because you've now overinflated the law of God. We don't do that. But we do love his commands. And we keep his commands. And we do understand we may have to have some standards to help us keep those commands. And we do our best to love him with all of our heart and to say, God, what you say is true. Let every man be a liar. I want to follow you and I want to keep your commands. Principle number four, lastly. You are a victor not a victim. I wanted, I wanted to hit this when we got to greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, but I didn't have time, and so here we are, and this is along the same lines. Look at verse number four. If this doesn't encourage you this morning, fire me. I've, I don't know. This, this, this better encourage you. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world that he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? All right, so I thank you for the amens. I appreciate them. Are you an overcomer? You are, yes. But let's ask it this way. Subjectively, were you an overcomer this last week? Or were you overcome? It's easy for us to come to church and sing, faith is the victory, and then go be a victim to our sin all week. But it's not fitting. Now, don't get the idea that an overcoming Christian is a super Christian. An overcoming Christian isn't some special category of Christian. That's, that's normal for a Christian. should be. It's what God intended to be, normal. And if you're not overcoming, that's subpar. God's blueprint for us is the day by day, moment by moment, week by week, to live in victory. I mentioned Nike earlier. It's funny because the, the, the word uh, here in this text 
is Nikeo, when it says overcomer. It's where the Greek goddess Nike, it's where they got the name from, is N-I-K-A-O, is the verb used here. And the Greeks would only use this verb of the gods, because the Greeks taught that a mere mortal could not truly be an overcomer in that way. And against that backdrop, John steps in via the Holy Spirit and says, no, you Christians, you who have been born of God, you believers in Jesus, you are, Nikeo, you are an overcomer. You can do this. You can prevail in the face of obstacles. And he doesn't say, oh, you're an overcomer, because it's a bed of roses and a valley of lilies and everything is just so sweet and so easy for you. No. He says, you can overcome the world. Now, if you know anything about John's writing in this book, he told us in chapter 2 that all that was in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, there's all these things the world comes at us with, with our passions and possessions and pride and wants to get us and hook us. He will say, actually in a couple verses, if you look at verse 19 of chapter number 5, look at it with me. He says, we know that we're of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Meaning that the world lies in the lap of Satan and Satan cradles and rocks the world and its system, this system of do and be and have. And what John says all through the book is that the world is ferocious and the world is venomous and the world is monstrous and this is difficult and you are going to have to fight lust and you are going to have to fight pride and the devil is involved in this. You don't just wrestle against other people. It's not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities and powers. He does not make light of our adversary he does not paint it as though it will be easy but he does say you can overcome he does say that world all that it has to throw at you you do not have to be subject to it and you can overcome that and you have to know that God has engineered your life So that you would have opposition, and that opposition would grow you, and you would begin to experience victory. But the greatest victories are against the toughest opponents. This is why the championship win is so much sweeter than the the first win of the season. Because it's the toughest opponent in the championship. This is why we praise dragon slayers, but we don't praise squirrel hunters. No offense to any squirrel hunters in the room. We recognize it's a different category to slay a dragon than it is to hunt a squirrel. And John is saying you do have a dragon to slay, but you can slay it. You can do this. And not just you can do this on your own because you have the power that lies within you, power of positive thinking, you have what it takes. No, you can do it because of the Lord Jesus. This is what allows us to overcome the world. He says it right in the middle of the verse, even our faith. Our faith. Faith in who? The Lord Jesus. He hammers it all in five verses. Believe on Jesus. Believe on Jesus. Believe on Jesus. We don't overcome by trying. We overcome by trusting. And he introduces the mysterious power of submission. That I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And while it may take some effort from me, he's not just going to treat me like a puppet, right? And put his arm in my back and just control me. But he will give me his spirit and I can walk in obedience and he can empower me and I can do this. Christian, don't have an Eeyore spirit. Don't walk through life. Hum drum, now the world is coming down on us. It's just the roof is falling in. It's so tough. I can't do it. I've tried. Stop. Stop. Read it. I didn't make it up. You're an overcomer. You can overcome. Christians aren't people who play scared. We're not playing to lose. We are the people who don't, we don't shrink back. We, we do not cower in fear or in terror, but people who stand up boldly in the name of Jesus and say, I can do this. I can overcome the world. I can kill that sin. I can mortify it. I don't know who told you you couldn't kill that sin, probably yourself, but you can. You can Nike that. You can slay the dragon. You can be victorious. That's an encouraging note. So Christian soldier, pick up your sword. Stop laying down and pouting. Do something. Trust in the Lord Jesus. Know that you can. 
If you think that you can't, then you're kind of right. If you think that you can't, you won't. Parents, we know this. We're trying to teach our kids something, something that's new that we're introducing to them when they're four years old. You can buckle yourself in your own car seat. I don't have to crawl back there anymore. You can do it. Hey, you're, you're in third grade. You can tie your own shoe. I can't. I can't. If they say I can't all day long, they're not going to do it. I try to teach my kids, don't say I can't. Say I'll try. Let's upgrade our, let's upgrade our language. Let's upgrade our thinking a little bit. Not I can't. I'll try. You may not succeed, but we're going to try. But better than all try is I can. And God says to you via the power of his Holy Spirit, you can. Men, I'm not sure. I want to talk to you specifically for a minute because I deal with this not necessarily on a weekly basis, but almost every other week with, with someone in the church. Oftentimes, you struggle a lot with sexual sin. And there's, lot, there's lots of addictions, there's lots of sins, but I get this one a lot. That you turned 13, your body started to change, and nobody taught you what to do with the gift of male energy, which is a gift, and how to channel that in the right direction. So you started to, at a young age, to channel that into mischievous behavior. You started to channel that into maybe sports. You started to channel that maybe into uh, sexual patterns of behavior that were unfitting, and pornography, and those sorts of things. And oftentimes, there's the 25-year-old, or the 30-year-old, or the 40-year-old that I'm sitting down, and I'm talking to who are saying, look, this has been long-lasting. This was an action, and that action became a habit, and that habit, it's not even a habit. It's a lifestyle now. It's, it's been 10 years. It's been 20 years that this has been, it's been growing, and it's been there, and I haven't been able to conquer it, and now this lifestyle, it's a destiny. I'm destined for this. I can't shake it. I've tried. I've confessed a million times. I've, 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 I've walked the aisle. I've asked for accountability. I've read a book. I've, I've, I've prayed. I, they anointed me with oil. I did whatever it was, and I'm still stuck in it. I can't overcome. Yes, you can. You can. Whatever you're struggling with as it relates to sin and temptation in the world, you can, via the Lord Jesus Christ, live a life of victory. I'm not saying that will be easy. I'm not saying that, that you won't fall down sometimes and then get back up, but you can overcome. And one day, we will look forward to the day where our sin nature will be gone and we're in heaven and all that the world has to throw at us doesn't come at us anymore. We look forward to that day. But if God wanted you in that day right now, he'd make it happen. But he hasn't. Where does he want you right now? Here, fighting, overcoming. There's a lot of reasons for that, not the, not the least of which is so that the world can see a testimony that is real and vibrant and active, that man, the power of the gospel changed these people. These people can act and think and behave and respond in a way that, I don't know how they do that. Well, I do. Jesus, do not, do not think you can't. You can slay that sin. There's a, a phrase that's been tossed around for a lot of years, more than 200 years, called meet your Waterloo. It refers back to uh, 1815 when Napoleon and his forces were met at Waterloo, which is present-day Belgium. And there, this multinational army commanded by the Duke of Wellington met Napoleon's French forces and they defeated Napoleon, which many people thought couldn't be done. And since that day, for 200 years, the phrase meet your Waterloo means... You've met someone or something that is too fierce and too strong, and it's an opponent that you can't conquer. And if I could paraphrase 1 John 5, 4 and 5 this way, I would say spiritually, the Christian never meets his Waterloo. The Christian never meets his opponent, be it the world, the flesh, or the devil, that he cannot overcome with the power of the Lord Jesus. And I'm not trying to pom-pom, cheerlead, just puff you up, self-help today. I'm trying to tell you the truth of the word of God. You can overcome. So let today be an overcoming day. Let this week be an overcoming week. Let this month be an overcoming month. And what you'll find is that all of this is connected. That if you will obey his word, you can overcome the world. And you have what it takes to obey his word and overcome the world. Would you bow your heads and would you pray with me?
I want you right now in the silence of these few moments to respond to the Lord. I'm not sure which one of these four principles hit you the hardest, but odds are one of them struck you and rung the bell more than another one. If it is the idea of loving your brothers and sisters in Jesus, then ask, do I love the Lord? Is that vibrant? Is there adoration? And is this pushed out to my brothers and sisters in Jesus around me? Is this pushed out to my church family? I would encourage you to, if it's not, to change that. I want you to ask yourself, man, do I see his commands as healthy and helpful and not grievous? Or do I resent them and begrudge them? Understand that God is for you. He wants to lead you in the path of joy. And his commands will help you. And if you've had just the wrong attitude towards God's law and God as the lawgiver, then repent of that and say, Lord, I like my political system, but that doesn't apply to my relationship with you. You're the commander. You're the king. You're the Lord. If you've been struggling with a doldrum, Eeyore mentality of I can't, I'm stuck, I've already tried, I can't shake this sin, in the name of Jesus, as lovingly as I possibly can, say, I, I tell you, please stop. Replace that broken thinking with the truth of God's word. You can. He can fill you. He can help you. There's victory in Jesus. We sing it, but let's live it. Would you right now talk to him? Would you confess if you need to confess? Would you ask for help and assistance if you need to pray for help and petition? If you're in the room and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want to talk to you for just a minute. Jesus Christ, Son of God, God became man. He lived in the flesh perfectly. He died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and he rose again. He overcame. And he offers life. He offers forgiveness of sins. He offers heaven to anyone who will put their faith and their trust in him and in him alone. And if you never have, I want to encourage you today to put your faith and your trust squarely on the Lord Jesus. If you never have, maybe right now in the quietness of this moment and the stillness of your heart, you would just call out to Jesus and pray and ask him to save you. If you'd like to do that, pray something like this. Just say, Jesus, today I put my faith and trust in you. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. And I'm making you Lord of my life. I'm not trusting in myself. I'm not trusting in any other gods. It's in you and you alone. My faith is in you. The Bible says if you will do that, if you will believe in your heart and you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, that God will save you from your sins. He makes you a guarantee that he'll take them all away and he can change you and live in you. Father, we come to you one more time with so many emotions, Lord, right now I feel encouraged. I feel ready to fight the sin of my life. Lord, I feel regret of not understanding some of these truths sooner. Lord, there's so many things in my heart, but right now I most of all just want to praise you for being good, for loving us with your commands. Those are a kind mercy that you would put stakes in the ground for us, that you would guide us, that you would help us. Lord, may we live for you. May we recognize, sometimes we don't even see it, that we're living for ourselves, that we're being selfish, that, we are, that we're breaking your laws. And Lord, give me the gumption and the clarity to be able to communicate that to your people so that we could see very clearly what is true and right and a do and a don't. And then Lord, what is wise and prudent? Give us this discernment and this help in our lives. Grow us. 
May we be more like you, Jesus. We love you and we thank you for being the victor, the conqueror, the one who conquered sin, the one who conquered the grave, the one who conquered death, and thank you for sharing that power with us. Jesus, it's in your name that we pray and we praise. Amen. Well, church family, I want to tell you that I love you, and I'm, I've been so joyed just to be in the house this morning and uh, certainly look forward to the night at 6. Um, friend Day, of course, is next week, but before we get out of here, I want you to take two minutes and I want you to watch this video. It probably will even say Night of Worship and Friend Day, which I already said, so forgive me for that. Uh, but it will let you know a few things that are coming up and that you need to be aware of. And as soon as this is done, you're dismissed. But love a brother and sister before you're dismissed. Can we do that today? Find somebody that needs a hug and give them a hug. Find somebody that needs a word of encouragement and encourage them. Find somebody that's been going through a tough time and pray with them. I would encourage you not just to slip out as fast as you can because the stillers start at 1. you got an hour and 15 minutes, okay? Love a brother and sister in Jesus before you leave. So be dismissed on that note, but watch this video first. Hi, church. Thank you for coming today. If this is your first time here, welcome. One of our pastors would love to meet you at our welcome desk after the service, and we'd love to put a small gift in your hand. Let's take a moment to see what's happening at Harvest. On September 18th, we'll be hosting our annual Friend Day. This is a Sunday set apart to open our doors to the community, provide a place for getting to know one another, and of course, center all this around Jesus. Pick up some invitations this morning in the track racks. There will be food trucks, bounce houses, and our annual cornhole tournament during the afternoon. So grab a partner and register on our website to be a part of the competition. We are looking forward to our night of worship tonight at 6 o'clock. Praising God through song is a way that we can collectively join together and unify our hearts through the truth of the gospel. Whether you're a singer or not, we hope you'll come make a joyful noise with us tonight. Thank you for spending time with us today. Remember to follow us on social media so you can stay connected with all that's happening in and around our church throughout the week. Until next time, have a great week.